Good morning. I'm like so excited to talk to you about edge to cloud security today. I hope that this talk ends up being a lot of fun. Uh, it is a technical talk. And before I get started, how many people in the audience actually do IoT work today? That is a super cool raise of hands. And how many folks are actually embedded engineers? A few? OK, good. So my name is Richard Elberger. I'm a partner solutions architect in the IoT segment. What I do is I work with silicon partners. The partners I work with is Microchip, Qualcomm, TI, and Xilinx. And what I get to work on with those partners is what's coming down the road. What do we need to prototype to help our mutual customers implement solutions down the road? So what you're going to see today are some prototype solutions I worked on with these partners. Um, now, I was going to have demos in the session, but what ended up happening when I was recording the demos is that I was flipping screens so often that it was like kind of crazy to follow. So what I'm going to do is, at the end of this talk, give you my GitHub contact information, my LinkedIn contact information. If you're interested in running the demos yourself, and there will be recordings later, that will probably still have the flipping. But if you want to run them there yourself, I can help you out with that. And all the code will be posted to GitHub. So let's go ahead and get started. In the beginning of this talk, what I'm going to do is give a high-level overview. This is a 300-level talk, so we get to see code and all that kind of fun stuff. But I do want to give you a lay of the land of what we're talking about when we're uh, dealing with security between edgy stuff and cloudy stuff, all right? And so we'll talk about uh, things like the shared responsibility model and that sort of thing. Uh, then we're going to talk about secure designs for a few use cases. And for each of these use cases, I work with specific partners. And um, so in that, there, it actually prisms out a little bit, gets a little bit more complicated. We talk about physical security, and we talk about application security, and we talk about communication security. So what I need to do is speak about all these things, and you'll see how that fills out throughout the rest of the talk and how I apply those security things that you need to worry about at the edge across all these different use cases. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about the shared responsibility model and, and what that means in the context of the edge. So you, nearly everyone in the room should be familiar with this model. If you're not, I suggest that um, you spend a little bit of time to understand how we work with our customers up in the cloud uh, to have a common understanding about the shared responsibility that AWS has with their customers. Now, we have this diagram. This diagram is published up on up on our website. But we don't just say, OK, customer, you're responsible for this stuff. Have a nice day. If you were here earlier, you saw a video from Trend Micro. Actually, Trend Micro is one of our great partners that helps our customers achieve that security model up in the cloud. right? And AWS provides tools for our customers as well. So we do end up uh, helping our customers achieve that goal of being secure from day one. right? But since I've been working with customers in the IoT space, what's been a little bit of a, a strange thing to get a grasp of is what does that mean uh, in terms of the edge, right? So the problem is with the edge, if you're a cloud-first customer, is there isn't really a shared responsibility model anymore. True, AWS delivers software to our customers that runs on hardware that you own and operate. But at the end of the day, this is hardware that you own and operate, or hardware that you are manufacturing for your customers to purchase for them to operate. So what we need to do is work together to ensure that our mutual customers, or, or you folks, are actually implementing solutions that are secure all the way up and down the stack. And AWS provides capabilities down um, that help you uh, what I should say is AWS partners that we work with provides those capabilities down the hardware level. And we're going to talk about that through this talk. And then how AWS provides cloud level capabilities to help you be secure at the edge as well. So this is a paradigm that you have to come to terms with, <clears throat> that especially if you're a cloud first customer. Now, what you'll see on the right hand side of this slide is likely why many of you have actually gone to the cloud full elasticity, virtually limitless, 
energy and storage. You don't have to worry about the secure physical environment because that's the lower part of the shared responsibility model that AWS takes care of. So we really need to figure out how we can mitigate these challenges that we're seeing on the left-hand side of the slide. That's what we're gonna go through, the whole confidentiality. How do you achieve confidentiality on the left-hand side? How do you achieve integrity on the left-hand side? How do you achieve availability on the left-hand side? These, independent, these use cases differ so much across, um, across these different verticals, right? So we really have to focus on these problems and, and put the screws down on it. So another prism that I want to have you consider, and we're only going to think about a, a couple of different perspectives in here, but when you're creating or manufacturing products that are IoT products and you're delivering these products to your customers at the edge or you're making IoT products for your own infrastructure, you have to think about the entire spectrum, the life cycle of the device as well. Now, the first thing is where you're getting your parts. You have to understand and, I guess, really trust your supply chain. This is something that uh, a lot of, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but we've seen many examples in the market where people try to take a shortcut, go to a contract manufacturer that may not be totally viable, and you don't really know where they're getting those parts to, to fulfill the manufacturing of your product. So this is a point that you need to cover off when you're, when you're talking about your design. Now, the part that we work with our partners with, especially those that have secure elements in TPM, such as Microchip and Infineon, and NXP and ST Micro, we work on this birthing of a device. How does the device come into the world? How can we securely provision that device and make it active and make it safe for our customers? Now, in this talk, we'll be spending most of our time in the operating phase. The operating phase is where the bulk of the life cycle of your device lives, right? There's a lot of opportunity for physical attacks, software attacks, communication attacks in this part of the cycle. And we're going to go through quite a bit of material today that's going to discuss this particular section. But what happens after your customer is done with this device? There's really two things that you need to cover off. First, how do you ensure that you're cleansing the hardware part? Can your customer pull a kill switch on that device that cleanses all the information. We don't want to have our customers leave personal identifiable information on these devices. The second thing is we need to ensure that we're also cleansing the cloud side because if you're not cleansing the device side, then there's opportunity to take that device and then connect to an account that already exists up in, up in the cloud or in a SaaS solution. So we need to carry off this piece as well. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to talk about this today. And if we look at the entire cycle, how this actually terminates, as these devices go back and, and get stored, or you throw them away, people can go and pick those and, and take parts off. And actually, there have been cases where people actually take the part off the device, like, for example, a Xilinx chip, which costs a lot, a lot, it could cost a lot of money, depending on how much fabric you have there and they'll, they'll take it off, and then they'll go, they'll re resell just a blank piece of, of uh, encasement. So we need to really, going full circle, we do need to care for that supply chain aspect. Just wanted to, to reinforce that point. Now, what we also need to achieve, and what we've been talking about for the last few years with our customers is how to achieve this continuous improvement with IoT. And last year we did a lot of work in delivering over the air updates to our customers, right? And there's a reason for that because we want to be able to continuously improve to improve the security, to improve the capability of our devices. One of the ways that we do that is with Device Defender. Device Defender enables you to audit and also in near real time, understand if there's any issues with the way that your devices are behaving. And it does that with machine learning. You can also do it, it's mostly also um, statistically as well. You define exactly what the behavior of your device is and when it goes out of bounds of those, um, those guardrails, then you can actually, what we shipped a few weeks ago is mitigation actions for Device Defender. 
Fortunately, we're not going to cover that today, but it's, it's something for you to consider, all right? Thing, uh, another aspect that we aren't going to cover today is how to continuously improve the intelligence of your devices over time. I actually did this with Xilinx at reInvent 2018. We had a workshop last year where we were able to continuously improve the intelligence of the device over time for object classification of a security camera within a building enclosure of a high value asset. All right? Now, if you can take that valuable data from your edge device, propagate up to the cloud, put it in your data lake, curate your data lake, rebuild your model, stage that, then that's super valuable and do that on an iterative basis. Now, something that does play into exactly what we're talking today, especially the second section when we're, we're talking about um, the smart buildings part, is being able to set up the continuous integration to improve the, the viability of your device, especially when it comes to security. We can't ask our customers anymore. This is what our customers expect. They expect our devices to be able to be updated to a safe way without intervention, right? It's no longer the case of routers of years ago where the customer finds out about an update and they go up to the manufacturer's website and download it and manually apply it. Because the attack vectors are changing so quickly, we need to help our customers to overcome those issues. So what we can do is take the data through, one of the things that we can do to improve our devices is take the data through IoT analytics, understand the statistics that we're, that we're curating there, make decisions about the features, functionality, security changes that we want to make on our devices, build them through continuous integration up in the cloud, and stage those firmwares up in the cloud as well. And again, we're going to talk about what that cycle actually means um, with device management in the second section, all right? Device management is a jobs management capability in AWS IoT that enables you to automate jobs in fleets of devices. Super important capability for ensuring that our customers continuously become safe. So let's talk about industrial IoT. Let's dive deeper into this particular use case and some of the attacks that we can see in industrial IoT. Um, are there folks that work in industrial today in the audience? Can I get a raise of hands, a few? Okay, so what's really interesting for those um, that aren't uh, working in the industrial space is that a lot of these protocols that are working in control systems and SCADA systems don't use security at all. Zero security. And in fact, if you talk to people in industrial, they'll say, what, it's in a closed place. We don't need security, right? Our systems are fully secure, like the, the actual physical system is fully secure. That's not the case. We have bad actors everywhere, right? So we need to come to a point where we can actually protect that. And um, IP networks, that's really for, uh, for like normal I, IT networks. What you'll also see is uh, in industrial spaces is a lot of video surveillance networks. Those networks are physically separated as well. This data comes up into aggregators. And if you are, not if, when you are actually interoperating with the AWS cloud, right? you'll want to have a single point where you're actually feeding that data up in the cloud. Now, if you're having lots of video data, maybe you're not doing that through AWS IoT, maybe you're doing that through Kinesis video streams, or maybe you're even using Snow Snowball, right? But all of these devices in this diagram are focused for attack areas, and you know what people really focus on is up in the upper left-hand corner now, because they're seeing that this is, this is exposed, right? So we need to take care of the, uh, the physical, the software, and the communication security for all of these devices. And further, the wired networks, these are serial networks up in these field bus protocols that also should be actively monitored physically, all right? So we need to take care of all of these different vectors. There we go. So, what we need to do then is understand what are the physical attacks. This is where we're looking at the physical section of this talk. What are the kind of physical attacks that we're seeing out in the market today? Now, we're going to cover off something that's a conceptually could be easier for you to understand, which is the tampering bit of physical attacks. 
but you've probably seen in the news a lot of um, happenings or academic findings about side channel attacks and looking at differential power analysis and how you can actually understand the private key that's being used in the device that, is, uh, that represents the device's identity just by doing side channel attack. So we need to understand how we can protect that, right? But th for example, in the semi-invasive case, why would anyone ever do timing analysis? If I'm a bad actor, I'm not only destroying stuff. I'm not only doing like physical denial of service, but I could also be a bad actor that's stealing important information about how your systems are operating so I can get a competitive edge. All these things are active in the market today that you need to consider. So in this particular, uh, in this particular case, what we looked at is if I was going to go to the extreme, if I was going to say if I'm a bad actor and, and I know how to overcome electromechanical sensors for detecting if an electrical panel door has been opened, for example. How do I possibly, and that advanced too fast, how do I possibly understand or actually combat that type of attack? If I can overcome, for example, an, an electrical mechanical sensor that I can manipulate with a magnet or something like that. Well, in this particular case, what we did is we took a sensor, which is a diffusion sensor that's made by Texas Instruments, and we hooked that up to a microcontroller, and what we were actually able to demonstrate is that, well, at least we couldn't figure it out, is how we can overcome the, the functionality, like how to overcome the type of sensing that this sensor grants you. And in fact, one of the main use cases that this sensor uh, applies to is tamper protection, all right? So what's really great about this too is that you can do this in low power mode because when the sensor is detecting metal, for example, if the door is closed, the pin is pulled low. So it's taking negligible energy. So actually you could run this on battery power, send an interrupt to the microcontroller, wake up and then send an alarm, all right? So it's a very, very convenient, easy to use sensor. And in this particular case, in order to implement this, and here we get into the code section, hopefully um, I can downshift. If someone has a question about what I'm going through, I can, I can totally go through it, all right? But what, what I used in this particular case was uh, CC3220SF. It's this board right here. It's a microcontroller that actually combines Wi-Fi with compute, they have something called a network processor that offloads all the TCP and TLS and all that kind of good stuff. And I just hooked it up to this guy and, and did this work. And what we're running on this microprocessor is Amazon FreeRTOS. Amazon FreeRTOS is a, is a real-time operating system that we've been curating for the last couple of years. And actually, it was um, originally developed by a guy named Richard Berry and he joined AWS several years ago. One of the ways to organize your code in FreeRTOS is by encapsulating chunks of code that could be timed differently or be prioritized differently in tasks. So what I did is that I captured this particular code in a particular task and ran it at um, a higher priority so I could catch the event. So if there was some other task that was running in the microcontroller that was taking up too many cycles, I would actually be able to get some additional cycles in this particular task. So pretty easy, I'm able to run a task, the scheduler runs that according to your schedule the, and the priority that you set. Um, the way that I'm going to take the information from this particular task and pass it on to another task is through a queue. In order to pass data through a queue, I need to define a message. So I have the structure to find the message type. I'm only going to send across one character. Why? Microcontrollers, we want to constrain the amount of memory that we're using. We don't want to be superfluous about the memory that we use. Uh, then we have just a while loop. This will run forever. And you're like, well, if it runs forever, isn't that gonna take up all the time? Actually, no, because later on you'll see that I have a delay, all right? And then I just check. Is my pin pulled high or is my pin pulled low? And then I set some GPIOs and I 
and say, okay, I'm going to send um, I'm going to send that over. Now, what's the, the thing about this code is that's not going to send the message every single time. I have a little check there that says, if I go back one, I have a check there. If the door status is the same as what's being seen right now, then I don't care. I'm not going to um, change anything. Right? So then I send it, and then delay. So now we have another task. We need to have another task to actually send this message. So what I want to do is take this message from Amazon for Yartos, and I want to send it to Greengrass. Okay? The way that you send stuff to Greengrass is over a TLS 1.2 connection. So in this case, um, what I need to do is uh, first, did I? So the connection has already been made in this code block. I had to reduce it for readability. So I'm just going through a while loop. Has the message been received? It's been received? OK, cool. This actually blocks the function. So it's not taking any cycles until after something is received on that queue. Once it's received, oh, there's the queue name there. Once it's received, then I create my buffer. So now you're like, well, Rich, that's a lot more information than what I had before. So the reason why it's formatted this way is because when we're doing MQTT, most times the most convenient format for sending MQTT messages is over JSON, right? So I format that in JSON and then eventually publish it. Now you're like, wow, Rich, that's pretty easy. Actually, Amazon FreeRTOS, the whole point of Amazon FreeRTOS is to implement platform abstraction layers to make sure, or not make sure, but actually ensure that the programmability of the device when it comes to working against IoT Core is simplified, right? And actually, we partner with our silicon partners like TI to implement those platform abstraction layers so the programmability is simpler for you. So now I've gotten the message to AWS IoT Greengrass. If anyone in the room has used Greengrass, you know that you can work in an offline capacity, right? So if I'm working in an offline capacity in Greengrass, actually what I can do is perform local actuation, perform local alarms, even when I'm not connected to the cloud. Also, what Greengrass gives you the capability of doing is queuing those when you're not connected to the cloud, connect or uh, queue those messages locally and you can define the length of the queue and all that kind of stuff, and then send that data once you're reconnected to the cloud. So then you can start curating that data from a global perspective. Now, when you send that stuff to the cloud, you don't only want to send it to one service, right? You probably want to proxy that to an, to an auditing capability. The way that you would send that to an auditing capability is to have it come ingest into IoT Core, then go to Kinesis Firehose, and then it can batch put to S3. All right? And then another way of actually getting stuff done, um, just want to, is say, for example, you don't only want to have local alarm. If you're connected, you want to have a global alarm. Then you can use SMS to, to message that. And there's an action in IoT Core that enables you to put things directly to SMS and get notifications. So that's all great and fine. The key point in this um, particular, OK, I missed that animation. So in this particular case, what I'm doing is um, I'm feeding this through an ingest. What you noticed before is I didn't use device shadow within um, Amazon FreeRTOS. It's a constrained device. If I don't have to do local actuation, which I'm not doing local actuation in this case, then I can just use straight up telemetry. But if I want to do device shadows to understand the state of all my devices in my fleet, then what I can do is uh, proxy that data into a Lambda function within Greengrass and then apply that data to shadows within Greengrass. Then those shadows in Greengrass can be synchronized up into the cloud. All right. In this case, it's, if the door state is in this, then I can actually locally actuate and alarm that locally. And in this, this is the other case. And then you can, probably what you don't want to do is have this automatically turn off. You want to have the alarm keep on going until someone verifies that the enclosure that has been compromised has actually, you've actually resolved that issue. Okay, so that is physical, the physical part. Let's go ahead and take a look at software security and countermeasures. Um, with this particular case, I work with Xilinx, and one of the, way, one of the things that uh, I evaluated with um, Xilinx 
and I, I did this prototyping on my own, is that um, we used the Ultra 96 board, which is, uh, has an Ultra Scale Plus processor on it. Uh, that means for the folks that aren't aware of FPGA World, you not only have like a Cortex-A processors on here that runs embedded Linux, but you also have FPGA fabric on here. This is the same board that we used for the workshop last year. So it is a very powerful device. In building architectures, it's somewhat similar to industrial architectures. But I would say that in building architectures, you would have a, a company that owns the, electric, the elevator system. It would be separated from those who own the HVAC systems. In these networks, what's very popular, especially in the HVAC systems, is the BACnet protocol. It's extremely pervasive. In the old, old days, they were doing Modbus-based sensing. But BACnet is the most pervasive. Again, in contrast to industrial, where you have EtherCAT and Profinet and Profibus and all these other types of protocols, even bespoke serial protocols, in the case of this as well, it's, it's not a protected protocol. It's totally open. Actually, um, they're changing that. In the last year, there's been an initiative for BACnet secure. Okay, So hopefully in the future, people will start implementing that new protocol. On the bottom, though, the, the elevator systems, these are usually fully functioning autonomous systems that are on their separate networks as well. Many times you'll see BACnet protocol in these systems as well, not a secure protocol. Physical security is super important in this case, right? Don't want anyone messing with your elevators. So all those would naturally aggregate up, and what you'll have here, um, actually in building management is a building management system that oversees all these systems, so you have like a global view. But all of these, again, have attack surfaces that you need to take into account. Every single one in isolation, you need to see what the physical, software, and communication vectors are that you need to cover off. And the same with the network, right? All through this, it really except so you see the aggregators So This is why I really want to point out, in each of these cases when I mention the aggregators and Greengrass, there is a TLS 1.2 connection between those two entities. When you see AWS IoT Greengrass going to IoT Core, that's a TLS 1.2 connection between those entities. But when you're looking on the far left-hand side, um, you really need to take consideration the networks in that case. In the smart building space, there's a lot, of, lot more bad things that can happen and what people do. In fact, what you may have heard uh, recently, well, in the last few years, you've probably seen in the news, where um, attackers have been actually um, extorting public sector and private sector companies when they take over these machines. That's actually called an application DDoS. And what's, in, what's been the worst, in the worst case is that they'll say, if you don't pay up, then what I'll do is that I'll make that a permanent DDoS, and it will be game over, right? So when we're doing application security, we need to ensure that we're actively evaluating these systems. This particular case, what we'll look at is a scenario for application DDoS in a closed machine-to-machine -machine network. How can we use the systems that we have today to overcome that challenge. So to mitigate this, what we want to do is be able to understand how we can mitigate these issues on mass scale, right? What we don't want to do is be in the situation where we're calling up Joe or Jane at the, at the building saying, hey, can you upgrade this firmware? We want to have the ability to keep systems available from the internet endpoint perspective so we could possibly get those fixes down into your machine-to-machine -machine networks. This is something not only um, working, I work with the partners, but customers are asking about this as well. How can I use these systems that we have in place to help facilitate OTAs, not just in endpoints that are directly connected to the cloud, but endpoints that are functioning in M2M networks? So when uh, we prototype that, what we needed to do was take a look at, okay, if I am a small 
building, all right? You're not going to have huge IT infrastructure in, say, a smaller apartment building, maybe 100 units. You're not going to invest tons of money, but you still need to have a building management system and you still want to have cloud connectivity. How can we actually keep the bill of materials price low, still keep the availability in case something happens, and also facil facilitate these changes over time? And in this particular case, what we were able to do was identify an easy to use system to achieve that isolation, all right? There's a system that's called Siemens Jailhouse that's been going on maybe for eight or nine years. Um, but just recently, they've hit a pretty good stabilization point, I've said, I would say. Maybe not fully production, but it's pretty stable. And what you're able to do is organize um, compute in cells on this physical hardware. And in these cells, I can either run embedded Linux, or I can actually run free RTOS, or I can run better mail applications. It's really an interesting system. And what you can do also is not only set up, um, <laughs> sorry, distracted by the music. So not only set up virtual ethernet between these devices, but you can also share memory. What's important about that? Now that I can share memory, I'm not dependent on the network. So if my network gets, even my virtual network, if there's some kind of DDoS happening on a TCP IP level, I can still trigger the other cell to reset if I need to, so I can overcome some attack. So this was pretty good. Now, in order to get that information from the building management system side that's directly interacting with the BACnet network out into green grass and then up into the AWS cloud, what we need to do is set up some routes. And in the first route, what we want to do is be able to have BACnet information, this valuable information that we can use to improve our building management, get that information out of that network and up into the cloud. And you can define a route for that and you can have that as a single ingest point. In the next um, part here, you can set up shadows and route those. So what you're able to do is have those devices on your BACnet network actually represent things up in the AWS cloud. Those things don't have to actively connect. If you want them to be managed as part of Greengrass, they still need to be part of the, man part of the Greengrass group so you can set up shadow synchronization. Even if those devices in the closed M2M network would never directly interact with green grass. Then what I can do is actually have the data that's coming from the shadow synchronization being sent to a lambda function. That lambda function can act as the proxy back to the BACnet server and then facilitate those uh, actions to happen from a building management system perspective. And the same, same thing coming back for telemetry, right? Yeah, so in this particular case, I actually interposed. The first one was coming into the system. The, this one is coming out. The point I want to make in this particular route is when you're sending data up into the cloud, you may not want to send it at the same rate that it's being received at the green grass system. So you want to apply sampling or aggregation patterns at that point. And that route actually enables you to take the data from the BACnet network, send it to a Lambda function for the aggregating function, and then propagate that data up into a cloud route so you can ingest it up into the cloud. Not at the same rate. If you're getting, for every BACnet device, if you're getting data at 10 hertz, you probably don't want to send it at that rate up into the AWS cloud, unless you really, really have to. Okay, so once we have that data up into the AWS cloud, if you think back of that diagram that I had early on about the continuous improvement, now I can start to see patterns within the data that's happening out at the edge. So you can get that data out from the edge and put it into AWS IoT Analytics. Now, this particular graph, it didn't come from something new. We've been doing this kind of work with anomaly detection in systems with our customers for several years now with regards to IoT, all right? But the systems that we have in place now to assist that, like AWS IoT Analytics, actually help, help you along much farther. You don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting yourself anymore. 
from that, what you can start to do is understand outliers. outliers. What's my high watermark? What's my low watermark? So you can begin to identify in your system what you need to resolve from an application perspective. Now, what you're seeing here, it could be an attack on your system where devices on your network are behaving badly based on some physical or software attack that someone is performing on your system. It could also be functionality in your own application. If you think back to that cycle, regardless of the case that you're working on, you can take that data, identify the requirement that you need for the fixes that you need to make, and propagate that fix through continuous integration. So how do I do that? You want to identify the outliers. So how do I do that? Well, <clears throat> in order to use, to find that fix, and in this particular scenario, we took the scenario that these are backnet devices, right? People aren't out there building bespoke backnet, backnet devices. You're buying an HVAC system. You're putting in the HVAC system. You have these control systems that pair with the HVAC system. And it's, it's like an OEM device. It's just part of the network. If a fix needs to be made to that system, you're actually not developing the software yourself. You're actually just applying a firmware package. In this particular scenario, we're like, okay, if we have a CVE happen, and we identify that a fix needs to be made to backend devices that are be behaving um, poorly, or someone is attacking, taking advantage of a CVE that has occurred, how can I quickly get updates out to my devices, right? In order to do device management, first of all, you have to sign your device because you're not going to transfer the physical payload, the physical device firmware payload through MQTT. That's crazy, right? You're not gonna do that. So it, it would be chunked, you would have to slice and dice it because there's size limits, then you would have to recombine that data down at the edge. It's not gonna happen. That's not how our customers work with that data anyway. So what we wanna do is we want to sign that data so we can ensure the integrity of that package once it's been brought down to the edge. In order to sign that, we need to use AWS Signer. What happens is that you take one, pack, you take the package, you put it into one bucket, and then you, you, um, you define your source and you define your target. The source is actually, you're defining um, the actual payload. Now when you're defining your target, actually it doesn't move your payload from the first bucket to the second bucket. The, the name of destination is a little bit of misleading. Actually, what's going into the destination is the signing information and the S3 pre-signed URL. So that's when you start your signing job and it will notify you. Not no, it, you have to check when your signing job is done. What's interesting about this is that what you can do if you want to automate this even farther is once the firmware or once the signing information has been placed in the destination bucket, you can also use S3 events to create a job based off of that, right? If you want to wire up all the automation, that's just forward thinking, but that capability is there. Now, in order to start that job, what you need to do is take that signing information, that signing information that's in that destination bucket is actually part of your job payload. It's part of your JSON job document. Every job document or every job needs to be unique. So if you're gonna do this on a command line, you have to generate a UUID. And then you can create your job. You have to have that JSON document that specifies what you want the end device to do to take care of that. The end device actually um, is also stuff that you would need to figure out yourself. What we'll find is that we can actually do that through a Lambda function within Greengrass. Now also, um, how do I define what devices I'm going to apply? If I have 20 devices I need to update in my closed M2M network, how do I identify those devices? You don't want to have, be in a situation where you're running uh, automation and you have to define every single device automatically. Whenever you have manual intervention, there's a chance for you to make a mistake. That's why we have thing groups in place in IoT Core. Thing groups enable you to group your devices so you can apply actions to them in mass. So that's exactly what we use in this particular case. So we can update those control panels. Snapshot also means, by the way, that you want to run this job once. Then you can check the progress of this job. Device management, 
tracks the completion status of all those devices that you're working with that are, that are in that particular thing group. So you're, in, you're on the edge side. You need to have a continuous feedback mechanism about the state of those updates. In Greengrass, you're able to consume that data about the job information into Greengrass. And then because it's a Lambda function, you have access to all that information. If you need to download the binary payload from a Greengrass perspective, you can download that down and stage it locally. Once you stage it locally, you can share it out to the building management system, for example, over NFS. So it can go and fetch that data payload. So there's a lot more detail in there, and that's going to be available in the demo uh, after reInvent that you can take a look at. So let's take a look at communication countermeasures. This is one of my more favorite parts. Um, actually, this is a new form factor. I should have, uh, should have also brought the larger SAMD21 explained. But in this particular case, we did work with both TI, with the network processor, and also microchip with the ECC608A and a new series of capabilities that they shipped called um, Smart and Go, which is pre-provisioned certificates, Smart Flex, which is pre-provisioned but with your own certificate authority, and also Trust Custom, which gives you full control over the secure element and the provisioning, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. Now, Smart Home is a whole different beast compared to the previous things that we just talked about. These networks are completely fluid. We don't have direct control, like in IT networks, of what's happening from a gateway perspective. So we can't always depend that we're filtering through Greengrass. Also, what's challenging in this particular case is we need to make provisioning easier for the consumers of these devices, right? We don't have IT people on staff that are, that are provisioning these devices. Now, what that means is these become perfect targets for attackers. Per, attackers um, would go after this in terms of, I, in terms of um, gleaning personal identifiable information and then scam these people in their homes. Also, they can take over devices and have them participate in botnets, right? So it can be super challenging. And all these can be targets, but many times what they're doing is that they're looking for these smaller personal devices, like handhelds. The networks can also be um, challenged as well. And when I, when I talk about this, I really think about what happens when I have someone who's coming in to my home to maintain my home. Do I really know that person? Can I trust that person? And can that person actually attack my network? Those are the kinds of things that we need to think about when we're providing these type of products to our customers. But the point is, between the devices, that if you're talking to IoT Core, that's protected. It's really the left-hand side, again, that's challenging. We need to help our customers um, protect those devices as well. We do have other kinds of attacks in the spectrum, right? But what we really, really see uh, happening a lot is device identity theft. How can I impersonate this device? How can I use that device information to gain information from the target system that it's communicating with? And then finally, how can we help our customers protect those devices? So, I have to start at the beginning here. If we look, think back, I need to talk about birthing a little bit in the device life cycle, right? What's challenging is that when people start off with something like Amazon FreeRTOS, they get the code and they'll run a demo and that demo has what's called dev mode provisioning. And you actually code into a header file the private key and the certificate, which you would never do, right? But it kind of teaches people the wrong thing that you should actually take that and put it just directly on Flash. If I was a crafty attacker, I could just, and for example, if I was a person maintaining homes and I knew how to lift, lift a personal identifiable information directly off Flash and this is what's happening, 
to your customers, then I could easily lift that and impersonate that device or even get access to personal identifiable information. So what we want to do is use other types of ways to, for authentication to help our customers. <clears throat> One way that I worked with TI is how can I get the certificate on demand and put it on secure serialized flash, which is part of the network processor on the CC3220SF. Another aspect that I worked with with microchip is for with the specifically um, trust in Go and trust flex is how can we easily simply pre-provision those certificates onto the ECC 608A, which is a completely tamper-proof element. There are other folks out there, for example, like Data.io, and um, I always forget this one, they're gonna hurt me, it's uh, Secure Things by IAR, that will actually own the entire process for you for provisioning and implement birthing certificates to have greater insurance when you're actually sending those elements to contract manufacturers. If we take a look at the lower right-hand corner, how does that flow actually work? This is actually a repository that I shipped with Texas Instruments earlier this year to provision uh, certificates safely. What I need to do is first be able to have a whitelist to put up into the AWS cloud. And then in order to provision certificates, I need to use AWS Certificate Manager, right? So AWS Certificate Manager, Private CA, enables you to do bring your own certificate, which is a paradigm that we have in IoT Core. That way, you're able to issue client certificates. That's fine. What we want to do is enable our customers to be able to turn on the device. And the first time that they turn on the device, well, maybe after they connect to the Wi-Fi and join some SaaS solution, is I want them to be able to, I want the device to be able to check has the certificate been provisioned or not. And if it hasn't been provisioned, then it'll go talk to API Gateway. Now, we're not just going to willy nilly provision certificates. What we want to be able to do is constrain that. This is where the whitelisting comes into play. The client code is actually generating a certificate signing request. Part of that certificate signing request is a public key fingerprint. Also part of that, uh, that signing request is a subject line. That subject line includes a CN value, which we're putting in a serial number. So now you have something that you have and something that you know, we're good. So we'll go and check to see, has that device been whitelisted? If so, then it gives back the public key. You can compare the public keys. If it doesn't compare, then you get back a 403. If it compares, you get a 200. And then it can go to another Lambda function and go and provision the certificates. And then talk to ACM, get back the certificate. Now look, at this time, I could just cut straight across and give the device back the certificate. Then what I, would I have to do? I would have to run just-in-time provisioning or just-in-time registration in order for that certificate to be registered with IoT Core. Well, I can just cut through all of that, right? So just have Lambda talk directly to IoT Core, create the, um, in, sorry, register the certificate, create the thing, create the policy. Usually what you can do is abstract policies so you can use them at scale using policy variables and then tie them all together and you're good. Now, I don't need to do just-in-time registration or just-in-time provisioning. Uh, once I send back the certificate, and get that registered, then I can talk directly to the device gateway. So um, what do we need to do from a low level to achieve that? Well, first of all, what we need to do is register the device identity. The device identity is like the number one thing that you need to take care of. It's your private key. You need to protect that. You need to help your customers protect that. Somehow during the manufacturing process, you need to do device whitelisting to get that document up into the AWS cloud so you can use it as part of the authentication, the custom authorizer process. Then we need to actually provision those devices and then finally we'll be able to connect. So let's take a look at how we do that. <clears throat> so this, these API calls come from the microchip crypto auth SDK, super cool SDK, fun to use. <clears throat> when I'm on the manufacturing line, I can use a test jig. In this particular case, I'm not using Trust and Go or Trust Flex. I would be using Trust Custom, where I have complete control 
over the certificate provisioning, right? Because I want to create the CSR and do provisioning up in the cloud. So I would need to still initialize the device and then initialize the public key. So now I've initialized the public key on the device. That's my device identity. It was a blank, Trust Custom is a blank device at the very beginning when you're birthing, okay? And this is a secure element that's tamper-proof and all of that. Now when I'm still on the manufacturing line, I need to prepare the whitelist. So in order to prepare the whitelist, I need to get two things, something I have and something I know. Something I have is the secure element, right? That can't change. That's an IC that I'm putting onto my device. That secure element has a serial number. So something I have is a serial number. I'm good. Something I know is the private key. In a secure element, well, that's my device identity. I'm not going to take my device, device identity. Even if I could, I wouldn't do it, into the whitelist and send that up into the cloud. But what I can do is take the public key, which has a mathematical relationship with the private key, and use that as part of the whitelisting. And yes, of course, there's another API call for that. And then over this test jig, what I would do is output via serial what would eventually be imported up into DynamoDB. Now, I'm not going to sit there for every single device and do a single put item. You would run, um, you would batch those puts up into DynamoDB. But the gist is, is that you're going to eventually register this. The other point of this is, in that manifest, there is no private information. Serial number can be public. Anyone can lift it. I can make an I score C call into that IC and get the serial number. That's part of the API. But um, also, public key, public information. Nothing secrets coming off the manufacturing line. So when the customer, oh, sorry, let me go back. When the customer gets the, their very, very cool device and they put it into their smart home, I want to do secure provisioning. And that device doesn't yet have any certificates on it. So what I can do is make an API call into the secure element, because the secure element, I've been talking about securing the private key, and it's tamper-proof, but it also does crypto offload. And with that crypto offload, you also get some um, X509 calls that you can make. One of those X509 certificate calls that you can make into the secure element on the 608A is to create the CSR. So I would go and create the CSR, return that back. Then what I need to do is send that up to the cloud, right, to API Gateway to get this provisioned. So unfortunately, the, the, well, fortunately or unfortunately, it's just the way that it was developed. The Wink 1510 that's normally pa paired with um, Atmel devices that's, um, in this case, we're using with the secure element does not have HTTP client offload. So for example, the CC3220 SF does have that. In any case, so I need to implement this in code that's free RTOS. Um, HTTP client, which is freely available, royalty-free, blah, 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 so I can make that call. Um, I still need to use the Wink 1510 to make the secure socket connection to API Gateway first, and then I can make the HTTP call. And then I will get that certificate back from API Gateway, and then I can run it, um, write it to a slot. Now, if I'm offloading to a communications module, I also need to write it to the communications module. But then you'll be like, well, Rich, can't someone just hijack what was provisioned and put into the slot and locked in the slot? Well, yeah, sure, you can write additional code to check to see if the certificate that's in the wink is actually the one that's still in the slot. You can do that code as well to protect yourself even more. You can uh, lock the slots within the 608A, but you can't lock the certificate, certificate storage in the wink. OK, so finally, when you connect, again, Amazon FreeRTOS, totally e easy to use. Since 2019-06, we changed the way that you actually connect to the cloud using Amazon FreeRTOS. There's a whole new network abstraction layer, so you can use multiple network protocols. So there's a couple of different structures that you need to get into place, and then you can finally connect to the cloud. No just-in-time registration, no just-in-time provisioning. You don't have to worry about that initial bump that happens to the client when just-in-time provisioning happens, because you've already provisioned your objects up in the cloud. OK, and then your connection is green. Great. 
So let's take a moment now to refresh what we went through in this talk, all right? Because we went through a whole bunch of stuff. And yeah. So what did we learn, all right? First, these security patterns that I just talked about significantly reduce the threats that can happen for your customers and yourselves, right? Now, I don't have a crystal ball, and I can't forecast everything that's going to happen. And these vectors continuously change. And if you're in security, you know this, and you're like sleep, you have sleepless nights and all this kind of stuff. And thing, attacks happen that you, had, you cannot even imagine could have happened, right? But we do overcome those basic threats. The only way to protect your device identity is by using physical security. And these secure elements are TPMs. Don't think, and secure enclaves too. Don't get me wrong, secure enclaves work as well. But we want to be able to encrypt your, um, your private key. We want to make it immutable. We want to ensure that people can't read that into main memory. Um, those analytics do matter, right? They can actually help you detect issues that you have either from application logic or from attacks. So this is one of the huge benefits of IoT is getting all this data up into the cloud and being able to do something interesting with it. Um, over the air updates, it's the norm today. <clears throat> I don't expect everyone to start doing it next week because usually the device development cycle is 12 to 18 months. But I, if you're not doing OTAs today, especially if you're not using something that helps remove a lot of that heavy lifting, like device management, then please take a look. It will really help accelerate your time to market there and help you um, keep your customers safe. So these threats are always evolving. Uh, when I do this talk again next year, I'm sure many things will change, and I'll have more interesting cases. Um, and all the demos will be available after reInvent, OK? So they will be up on GitHub. So please, um, what you can do, oh, one more thing. I do have um, a demo session in the village this afternoon at 5 PM, where I will be giving live demos with these devices. All right, so if you're interested in that, please come to the village, and uh, you'll see that demo. Um, <clears throat> OK, gratuitous slide about training and certification. But thank you. This is my contact information. If you're interested in running the demos yourself, or you would like to have additional information about those demos, um, or even some of the solutions I've talked about from our partners, uh, please reach out to me. All right? And uh, thank you. And I'll, I have a couple minutes for questions. <clears throat>